So Shelly and I are trying to grow a garden. It's not easy. I don't have green fingers. And on top of the inevitable bugs and plant disease, folk have told us that having dogs isn't really friendly towards growing a garden. I suppose if we had a few extra coins, we could pay somebody to create and maintain that space. But maybe one day in the future, we'll have that blissful privilege. But what we do do is we go to the forums, online videos, and we are in the space where we have a couple of uncles that we can talk to about that. So I'm thinking particularly about Uncle AB. So it's useful to have conversations like that. He's actually grown quite complex gardens and plants. And so it's useful to talk to him and also to emulate some of what he's done. And in doing so, we can step by step grow our garden and maybe make something beautiful. In our gospel readings over the past few weeks, some of the Pharisees told Jesus to get out of the city because some of the other Pharisees were looking to kill him. Then we read about people who told Jesus about a group of Galileans who were murdered by Pilate while they were making sacrifices. That's incredibly grim stuff when you read it. They were executed while making sacrifices. And so they may have said this because they had deep concern, compassion for Jesus. Or they may have said this because they were trying to get rid of him. So it might have been some other reason. But what it draws my attention to is the story of Socrates when his friends and the corrupt authorities wanted him to leave the city. So they wanted him to leave for different reasons. Socrates' friends wanted to protect him from the inevitable trial and execution. And the authorities wanted to reduce his influence in the city. So Jesus responds to these folk by saying that as a prophet, it was his course to be killed in Jerusalem. It was his course to speak out, to cast out evil and to heal people. Now, when the Spirit of God rests on someone, it's incredibly beautiful. It's attractive. It's irresistible. But that's only part of the story. When the Spirit of God rests on someone, it also stirs the ire of the Pharisees. And when we look further back in Scripture, it stirred the ire of Cain when the Spirit of God rested on his brother Abel. And it stirs the ire of corrupt authorities. The reading caused me to think about the time when God's approval for Abel caused Cain to be angry and sullen. And God comes to Cain and he says, if you're doing what's right, you should hold your head up high. But if you're not doing good, sin is crouching at your door and it wants you. Cain gave in to his resentment and killed his brother. When God confronted him, he responded by saying, I don't know where my brother is. Am I my brother's guardian? So the injunction when we look later on in scripture given to Ezekiel is that he should correct, direct, admonish, keep, uphold his brothers. Paul and Jesus are aware that a godly pattern of life is beautiful and points to God's glory and causes rejoicing. And they were also aware of the other effects. Telling the truth, living out virtue, caused murderous rage in the Luke 13 gospel reading and idolatry in the Philippians reading. Both of those uh, books we've been going through through the course of Lent. So Paul's repeated encouragement is to keep paying attention to those who set a godly example and to imitate them. In addition to reading scripture daily, it's important to listen to trustworthy voices. Otherwise, it's easy to be whimsical, misguided, manipulated, expedient or destructive. I find even in my own life that it's easy to be coward, coward-like, not to be courageous, not to speak up, to keep quiet when I should say something. It's so easy to fall into that. It's so easy to follow one's resentment. Then there may be other ways to identify trustworthy people. But generally, I find that trustworthy people are able to make 
coherent, integrated arguments for faith and to live consistently. They also have a tendency to stand alone and to bear the painful consequences when they speak out against moral corruption. They act virtuously. They demonstrate courage, care, truth and beauty and they create meaning, strength and beauty sometimes out of tragedy and especially during difficult times. Living out one's faith isn't easy, even without pressures like persecution and opposition. So if I'm going to aim at living virtuously, it's useful uh, to find people who are doing just that. It's a useful principle and it's deeply edifying to identify people who are worth imitating to help me live out faith in Jesus. And this Lent, that's what I've been thinking about. I've been thinking on beauty, courage, generosity, life-giving routine, virtues, and principles that proceed and transcend the inevitable storms of life. And I suppose it doesn't make things easy, but it does make the path easy to identify, to live out uh, one's faith. And so that's my prayer for this Lent, that that the sacrifice of food would lead us to, as a family, um, concentrate on scripture and to increasingly live out virtue as, as those who have gone before us have.